So I don't know how many of you are from Brussels. I've been living in the city for the last nine years. So I've been telling you a little bit what it means to have a normal work day in Brussels. Usually you will take the metro to go to work. Uh, in the metro station, you can grab a croissant, a pain au chocolat, uh, with coffee. You scroll through your phone. You look at advertisement of um, food, usually. That's what I get in my social media. Uh, then you arrive at work. For lunch, usually you will go to one of these uh, small supermarkets. You're considering whether to buy biological fruit. However, it is a little bit more expensive. And we still don't know, is it really worth it? Additional money, the additional value? Still don't know. But in the meantime, let me grab conveniently packed meal that I can quickly eat so I can go back at my desk. And while I pay, also I look at that bar of chocolate that is nearby the counter. So I grab also that one. After work, luckily we have time to go out. And what do we do in Brussels? We eat fries and beer. This is our standard dinner, especially for Thursday night. So this is just to say, um, I'm pretty sure your work life is not much different, regardless of where you live in cities. Which leads me a little bit to the question, how much of what the food choices that we make are really free choices? And how much in that is the result of indeed the place where we live? You've heard a lot of the concept of food environment. I hope you're already familiar with it. But food environment is really fundamental when we're looking at healthy living in cities. Food environment is the social, the economical, the cultural context, the political context, the physical context in which we access food. And particularly for cities, thinking about healthy living in cities without looking at moving a bit beyond consumers' information and labeling and putting all the pressure on consumers to make the right choice will be really missing the point. So how European cities look like? Well, unfortunately, cities are very much part of the problem. You might know that 80% of European citizens live in cities. And cities are usually the place where we have the highest level of obesity, the highest level of food waste, the highest level of overconsumption, and also the highest level of food insecurity. Um, when we look at uh, studies that have been made in the Netherlands <laughs> by Wageningen University, 80% of the food that is accessible in the supermarket is usually considered beyond, not in line with the healthy dietary guidelines. When we look at Amsterdam city center, 80-40% of the food that is sold in city center is fast food. So, I mean, if you're looking for healthy meals in Amsterdam, no, not very easy. It's not like Brussels is a lot better if you're looking at uh, the Brucaire area. So we, this is, look, we are really looking at food desert, areas in the cities where you have no access to healthy food, and food swamps instead, where you have quite a lot of food. However, it's incredibly unhealthy or uh, detrimental to sustainability also. That's also important. When we move instead a neighborhood level, the situation doesn't improve. Lots of studies have shown correlation between poverty, higher level of poverty, and higher amount of fast food chains which of course means most of the time, again, higher level of obesity and also higher consumption of processed meat. And when we move to children, situation doesn't improve. I'm sure a lot of you, again, are familiar how the rise in obesity in children. However, it is also connected to the lack of functional urban spaces, uh, green areas, but also pollution, in particular air pollution. There is really a correlation with air pollution, obesity, and it means that living in certain parts of the cities over another, I will not, but I just move in one of those parts of cities of Brussels, it can mean 10 years of life loss, comparison to if you live in a more wealthy neighborhood. As you might know, living wages are getting, the power of consumers is also not improving, and <laughs> means the situation will not improve. In the UK, the Food Foundation has found out that people living in the lowest 10% of society will need to spend 75% of their um, money if they want to buy food that is in line with the UK healthy dietary guidelines. So this was the grim picture. So now I'm going to move off how can we solve all of that, again, looking at the lenses of food environments, because cities are really, really, really <laughs> changing things, or they are trying to change things. Because uh, um, for a long time, cities have been looked that they have nothing to do with food. I mean, food is produced outside of the city limits. Why cities will work on food? Food is competence of the national level, regional level. However, this is where in cities, it's where in, it is in cities that innovation, innovative policies are both um, designed and implemented together with citizens. 
So when we're looking at healthy diets in cities, we are looking at innovative approaches that is looking at a systemic way to address food system, alignment of very different policies, but also a cities and centers approach. So this is really the difference. And this is what we are seeing at EuroCity, so really are really taking the lead. And we are sharing this innovative approach because the challenges are a lot. And so we are really looking at sharing and, and see how best we can move forward because the challenges are complex. I've been, been hearing quite a lot today, so and just some days that I've been mentioning before. So what cities want to do is really make sure that healthy, sustainable food is not only the most accessible, but is the preferable choice and is also the most affordable choice. How do we do that? A series of action can be done by cities. It is being done by cities, the most ambitious one, that also have a cohesive food policy. The first one is urban food production. And do not think of urban food production as the little garden in the background. Really, food production for food provisioning, particularly in the poorer neighborhood of cities, is something we are seeing a lot in Groningen, but also in Athens. These uh, food production gardens are really about citizens' integration, education, support, migrants' integration, also how we want to teach, uh, help uh, citizens to go back to cooking, cooking healthy. Another approach is providing spaces in the cities for local food markets, uh, also connecting with local farmers, smaller farmers, so giving them a space for selling local fruits and, and vegetables, so seasonal vegetables that also make, again, a connection with production. And this is something we've seen a lot in the south of Europe, Spain, Italy, France. It's incredible the number of food markets that we see. Another area of work, and this is really one of cities' secret weapon, is food procurement. I've uh, been looking at uh, strategic use of procurement in cities for quite some time, and you might have all be familiar with Copenhagen. Copenhagen has now 90% biological food for all their public canteens, from kindergarten to school, but also senior citizens' uh, home. So this is really a way forward. Then there is indeed the more banning approach. What do they do? They ban new fast food retailers, for example, nearby, city, uh, nearby schools or advertisement of fast food chains. So for example, in Transport for London, you will not have any more advertisement of unhealthy food. And affordability. One of the outcome of COVID-19 pandemic has been a rise in cities looking for food aid solution. Uh, in the city of Paris, 25% increase, particularly among students, homeless people, people with migrant backgrounds. And in the city of Madrid, now they have to invest 51 million euro in food aid solutions. Also, um, like if you're thinking of a city budget, even a big one like Madrid, this is a gigantic number. Finally, um, governance. Cities are not alone. They have to collaborate with regional level, with the national level, particularly when it comes to taxation, support to food aid, affordability. But above all, really the secret weapon is citizens' inclusion. If you include your citizens, if you involve them in food policy creation in the Food Council, if you provide support to communities to work around food, this is really where you can achieve the biggest change. So what is the way forward? Where when you acknowledge the role of food environments, we need to move a bit away from the idea that it's solely the consumer responsibility to choose healthy and sustainable. That putting a label on food will really achieve such a strong change because knowing a thousand calories burger will not prevent me from eating a thousand calories burger. Um, so we really need to look beyond and understand the causes that lead people towards unsustainable food choices, a local, regional, but even a neighborhood level. Also, acknowledging the food environment means acknowledging that the biggest power is actually with retailers, and this is really in their hand to make the biggest change in the food offer that they give to citizens in supermarkets, uh, in the chain. But also addressing food environment means addressing some of the systemic issues around food, in particular poverty poverty and affordability. And to do so, we really need a systemic approach to food that goes at every level of governance, from the EU to the national to local and cities, um, every kind of uh, actors of the food system change. That was it from my side. Yeah.